Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for very much for coming. We're going to have a terrific session today. I've got five young athletes, the one sitting at the back, and a young coach. And we're going to talk about the Gold Coast and what it means to state sporting associations in WA. I'm going to do a little bit of death by PowerPoint to begin with, uh, but then we'll get to the young people. Very quickly, my involvement, I, I first started with Commonwealth Games in 1982. I was part of the English athletics team in Brisbane. I've been to various editions along the way, working for England or Australia. My last active one really was Glasgow in 2014 when I was on the Australian athletics team. As far as Gold Coast is concerned, I was actually quite modestly involved. I had a chance to walk, very privileged to walk with the Queen's baton relay, which was nice. I'm a member of the Cycling Australians High Performance Advisory Group. Uh, I was part of setting up the sports psychology initiative for some of the minor sports who hadn't had psychology before, and I consulted to a handful of coaches and athletes. But, but in general, I had a modest input into these particular games. As far as funding is concerned, we, it goes on a lot. It's an easy excuse to talk about all the lottery funding that the UK gets. Um, but to be honest, those sports there, those numbers we're talking about, they're not bad numbers. You know, we'll always complain, we always want more and so on and so forth, but we couldn't really say that we were underfunded at this stage. Also, there was some extra funding given to Commonwealth Games initiatives. The sports got different initiatives. In athletics, for instance, we got quite a bit of money to work on relay teams. So I would say, in general, the funding was, was adequate for these games. For those of you who were here a couple of years ago, we did a talk very similar when we reviewed the Glasgow performances, when I was perhaps a little bit pessimistic about our performances there. We talked about this idea that it takes a village to make an athlete, and I talked about Colm O'Connell, who's an Irishman who works in Kenya, uh, very successful coach working with very successful middle distance athletes, and he talks about this idea that it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, if the coach and others cannot coordinate all aspects of the preparation, then you might as well stop. And I guess my question four years ago, and again it's the question today to some extent, is what sort of village is WA in terms of producing elite athletes? A few statistics from Glasgow 2014. Glasgow's obviously in Scotland, but as far as the English team are concerned, that's virtually a home games. Uh, England came out on top, sort of getting almost 60 medals in each category. Australia in the 40s, Canada 32 golds. And that's, you know, that was an okay effort by Australia, I think, but again, home court advantage to England, so they did very well. But what I did comment on when we met four years ago to talk about this sort of material was how probably WA underperformed in terms of its contributions to the team. There were 33 headquarters staff, none of those were born in WA. There were 26, 27 staff on athletics, uh, and only one of those was born from WA. And amongst the 99 athletics athletes, the performers, three were born in WA. So not big numbers by any stretch of the imagination, and probably worse, when you looked at the 100, 118 other staff from the other sports, there were only three born in WA, something like 2.5%, which is a very small number. Okay, so the context, what's been happening since those last Commonwealth Games, well certainly the GB have done astonishingly well. After London 2012, most people would have predicted that they would have gone down in performance. In fact, their performance is enhanced in the Rio Games, where they came second with an incredible 27 gold medals. Australia finished 10th with eight golds. Uh, so that's, that's a big thing, the growth or the, the march of the Brits. There's been a growth of women's sport, especially around things like AFL, rugby sevens, rugby league, soccer and cricket, etc. which on the one hand is absolutely fantastic, certainly fantastic for young women who are interested in those sports and for those sports, but I would flag that that is potentially a problem to some of our traditional Olympic and Commonwealth Games sports. There have been plenty of changes happening at the AOC, the Australian Sports Commission, the AIS, and many national sporting organisations, certainly post Rio, it's been a major clear out. And even as we speak here in, in May 2018, there are people losing their jobs at the AIS, being told they don't have a, a role anymore. And that's really quite a significant change. There have been mental health issues talked about openly now, uh, particularly amongst retiring athletes. Back in the day, that was never the case. That was almost like a dirty secret we kept to ourselves. So that's out and about, which is a very positive thing that it's now being discussed. 
And then just immediately prior to the Commonwealth Games, we had the cricket ball tampering saga, which in the overall schemes of things of world geopolitics isn't the biggest thing, but it was crushing. It was embarrassing and humiliating. And it came at a time when, from an Australian high performance sporting point of view, that was causing us some angst. Thankfully, very quickly after that, we got to the Commonwealth Games. How good were the Commonwealth Games? I thought they were brilliant. I thought it was really marvellous. And from an Australian perspective, we did really well possibly overperformed in some areas, but it was a great experience and it goes to show the merits of having a home games. This time, uh, WA was well represented. There's a whole list of athletes here, which you can see athletes from a range of sports. We had 30 athletes there, 20 of them came home as medalists, which is fantastic. And then we had some accredited Australian team coaches and medical staff, which was a good list. Okay, continue with the theme, how just how good were those games? The integration of the para sports was fantastic in some disciplines and some sports did really well. There was a bit of that in Glasgow, but they increased it for Gold Coast and it was a great success. Some of the sports and some of the events in the sports were truly world class. Things like netball, squash, rugby sevens, etc. That was like a world championship, no doubt about the quality. In some other sports, and some events within certain sports, that wasn't the case. There was a dearth of talent and things like in the basketball where Australia won two golds, which was fantastic. Frankly, lots of the other Commonwealth nations aren't very good at basketball, so that wasn't a great success. The other thing that we talked about, the volunteers were outstanding. As they were in Sydney 2000, the games makers, as they choose to call them now, were absolutely fantastic. Okay, as far as the medals were concerned, Australia virtually got 200, um, 80 gold medals, outstanding achievement, virtually 60 in the silvers and bronze, England coming in second. The surprise package was India. India managed to get in there with 26 gold medals, so Canada, who are used to coming third at games, only came fourth, and in part that's because they got so many silver medals. They got 40 silver medals, it was extraordinary, but hearteningly, uh, there were 39 countries out of the 71 who actually medalled, which is very good. And the para-Olympic, uh, para-athletes did especially well, where we got something like 46 medalists. Australia got 46 medalists in the para-events and disciplines from 38 events. They were great Australian role models for people with disability. All right, let's talk about some of the individual sports. As far as athletics was concerned, um, Really good representation. More than 50% of the medalists from the London 2017 World Championships were there, which was great because that isn't often the case. 16 countries won gold medals and 22 countries won medals of some description, which is a very high ratio, very pleasing with that. And Australia finished top, which was excellent, and it got more than double the number of golds when compared to Jamaica, who finished second. So good spread of good international countries turning up and a number of them winning medals. In swimming, Australia were outstanding. So it was almost un indescribable. Such a domination. 28 gold medals, almost four times as many as England, who got their second place. Seven countries won gold, and 10 countries won a medal, which was the same as Glasgow 2014, which I think is OK. Uh, but when compared to athletics, it shows it wasn't such a broadly spread sport. But then when you get into things like cycling, so Cycling Australia, we're very pleased with our performances, really, really happy. Uh, ten golds, the second best team was Scotland with four, so yeah, really quite a thrashing. However, only six countries won medals. And I personally, I'm thinking that's not a great look because it shows a sort of a, almost a cliquey domination. Gymnastics, a bit similar. England won that with six golds. Australia were third with two golds. Again, only seven countries won medals. And to be honest, this was one of the sports where in some of the events, not all by any stretch, there were some Olympic champions there, but in some of the events, the English were kind of sending a very young team, or rudely, it was described as their C team. So that, the gymnastics, I don't think they did themselves any favors with how the Commonwealth Games Federation would view them. So what's been happening in the sporting world, which we need to be aware of almost in that interim period between Glasgow and Gold Coast? First thing, very big in the UK, is the growth of pracademics. Funny old term, obviously a made up word, but this is about having academics with practical experience. They talk a lot about the science, the evidence, backing things up, and UK are making a big push 
on that at the moment. And likewise, they're talking about the growth of the significance of data. Probably most of you have seen the movie Moneyball, where they use statistics to pick up this team in baseball, which ended up being a World Series winners. Well, the English Institute of Sport is doing something very similar as far as that goes. It's an evidence-based approach to integrating injury and illness trends and respective training loads, a whole heap of work going on in terms of, so if you miss out that training session or you miss out that last set, you know, will that stop the athlete from getting injured? They're doing a whole heap of work in that area. And they've got a new position, which some people say sounds like a bit of an oxymoron, but the head of sport intelligence, amazing. You know, I didn't think I'd ever live to see the day. And that person is tasked with the delivery of the so delivering the so-called high performance system data strategy, which is about trying to see are there smarter ways of exploiting the information, exploiting the knowledge and making better decisions. And then they've got a thing called sharing good practice, which we're going to do here in WA as well. We're kicking something off in June. And that's something that's happened in the last few years where they've had a new approach to borrowing ideas from different sports, collaborating and working together we come up good ideas so um, they call it the sharing good practice initiative so in March a session took place amongst the Olympic team sports which was called the perfect warm down after training I mean pretty specific stuff but kicking it around sharing ideas sharing good practice and trying to come up with ways of working and we're going to do something similar in WA they've also done a thing on so-called serial winning coaches I talked to some coaches up in the Gold Coast uh, from the UK and they talk about SWC, serial winning coaches, and this is the idea where they studied 17 so-called super coaches. These are coaches who have managed to repeat success on more than one occasion. A whole heap of material, loads and loads and loads, but to summarise it, they talk about this idea of a driven benevolence, which is the relentless pursuit of excellence balanced with a genuine desire to support the athletes. And they say there are three planks to this theme. One is see, the athlete is seen as a compass. They're almost the barometer. If you're doing something and it's not for the athlete's benefit, it doesn't get done. This idea of having a high moral stance. Certainly, you know, I've been working in high performance sport for, for some 35 years. And there's certainly been passages where things like you know, morality and integrity and other things like that have been thrown out the window. That's not the case anymore, which is really good, really interesting. And then the last thing is that these serial winning coaches is they have a strong emphasis on the relative work-life balance, not only for their charges, but also for themselves as well. Medal winning leadership. Uh, this is some work that the Brits have used. It's from originally a Canadian piece of research. Again, interviewing Olympic medalists, interviewing their coaches, coming up with ideas as to what makes those coaches and it talks about things like the need to have three categories demanding leadership relationship leadership and then the solution focused leadership quite a tall ask for coaches to have and i just ask the question and it's for people in this room and people at the national level it's clear that the brits have been doing very well in the last few years probably since 2010 or something in the build-up to london 2012 olympics they're making a massive investment now, fair enough, they've got the lottery funding, but in relative terms, they're making a massive investment in the development of their coaches. The personal development, not necessarily the sport specificness, but the personal development and improvement of their coaches. I wonder if we're doing anything similar. So what about the preparation for the Commonwealths? Uh, all pretty much basic stuff, I think most of you know this. For most sports, Clearly we have a daily performance environment, which is where people are training every day, often here in Perth, obviously, for most of our athletes. You then often find yourself going to a holding camp or a staging camp, and then finally you go into the competition environment. And my plea to be to any of the state sporting associations was we have to get smart at doing that. I think we did do a good job for Gold Coast. The daily performance environment has to be more relevant, to my mind still, too many young Australians seem to think that training hard equals success and training harder equals more success. That ain't true and I hope I'm preaching to the converted. The daily performance environment needs to have some things which in some way will replicate a little bit more of the competition environment or at least, the very least, the holding camp environment. The holding camp environment can also be a little bit unrealistic. Typically, certainly if you're with athletics, you go to a nice hotel <clears throat> 
you probably have complete dedicated access to a facility, which is really nice. I know the swimmers would be pretty similar. The transport is pretty easy. You know, we had buses taking us here, there and everywhere, and you're only with athletics, so really pretty bloody good. But completely unrealistic in relation to when you go into a multi-sport games like the Commonwealth Games or the Olympic Games. So it's sort of, it's nice, but be wary of making it too nice because I think that can then play against you when you go into the multi-sport environment. And I, again, would argue that to my mind, not enough work goes on in the, high in the holding camp environment to prep athletes for the real deal. Uh, in cycling, uh, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't completely um, new and innovative, but we had a two-day thing, a two-day sort of dress rehearsal dry run uh, at the velodrome. Really good, went really well on the first day, fantastic. People were doing world record performances. And then we planned to have a fake power cut the next day on the second day. There wasn't a power cut, obviously, because that could be dangerous in, in the cycling environment, but we had a fake one, and they went around, they actually just turned the lights off, which was good. Uh, and that, the problem with a power cut, obviously, you never quite know when it's going to come back on. If somebody says we're on a power cut and it's for 30 minutes, you can obviously adjust and do all that sort of stuff, but it's almost like a, a bad weather interruption for an outdoor event or something. So we did that, we did it at a 30 minute power cut and then got back on and carried on doing the dress rehearsal. And what we learned from that, I, th I think slightly surprising, was that mainly it was the coaches who dropped their bundle. They were really angst, really aggro and not very happy at all. And that tells you a lot, <laughs> obviously. And so we've, you know, hopefully we put in a couple of um, tactics to help with some of that stuff. So the holding camp environment is really important. And then finally, the whole the competition environment is different. So this is from 2014, so it's ancient history. That's Grant Ward, who was there really to make sure Kim Mickle got her gold medal, which is good. So she did, fantastic. He coached, he used to coach her one to one, and she pretty much got you know, perfect tuition. She was at waste. She pretty much got everything she wanted. But by the time you got to the games, Grant was in charge of six javelin throwers and two high jumpers and two heptathletes and a decathlete. So suddenly the competition environment relative to what Kim was used to was uh, all a bit scary and it all went wobbly momentarily. All right, so in a minute, we're gonna get six young people to come and sit out the front, a coach and five athletes. But where I wanna get to, what I wanna be talking about or what I, I think the, the State Sporting Association need to be thinking about, where the village to hopefully create people to get on the plane to go to Tokyo, to get on the plane to go to Birmingham is what should we be doing? How will we ensure we get people on that plane for a kickoff? And then once they get on the plane and they arrive at the other end, will they deliver? We have got medal winning young people in this room, which is absolutely fantastic. And you know, we're, we're privileged to be in their presence. If I wanted to put a caveat on it, I'd say they won medals in Australia. So now the real beautiful thing, like the serial winning coaches, the serial winning athletes is now to go and do that in some foreign place. And we, you know, collectively, individually, our responsibility, I would suggest, is to make sure this village here, a lot of that is based around waste and other things, but this village does the best possible thing to help prepare these young people to go out there. People, the older people in the room, and I suspect I might be the oldest, but the older people in this room, it's like we send these young people out to go and fight our battles, which is kind of okay, because their bodies are ready for it and they're good. But our obligation needs to be that we prepare them as best we can so that when all that other shit happens, you know, they're ready for it. It's not a complete surprise. That's enough of my waffle. Um, ladies and gentlemen, would you mind coming and sitting out the front now, please, the coaches? What uh, I finished as an athlete probably about maybe 2005, 2006. Um, at a world championships. Through that stage I was doing an education degree and I had no intention of coaching, never wanted to be a coach. Um, I probably got into coaching by my uh, mentor that I was working with at the time. Um, and I think he sort of said to me that just my temperament was probably what attracted me to be, wanting me to be his assistant at the time. Starting in a program with very few athletes. Um, I think we had one athlete under the age of 16 um, we had a very top end heavy program and I think when he sort of when I first sort of started um, I was very reluctant I didn't want to do it. I wanted to finish my degree and move on to um, other things in life I was you know happy, happy to go in that direction I remember sort of getting off the plane and him sort of calling me and um, just sort of saying look can you give, give me a hand in the afternoons for a while 
and after about two weeks, he went away for six weeks. So he um, it went from just helping out afternoons for two weeks to going doing every session for six weeks, and then I'm deferred uni six months later. So it um, it was a very quick progression uh, into swimming. Uh, the program. I was given a lot of free reign for what we're doing because obviously he was um, working with Olympic le level athletes himself at that point and we had no underpinning, no underpinning group at all uh, coming through so I think the words he said was the, the program can't get any worse than it is, so just do the best job you can. Um, and you know to me culture was such a big thing in what we brought as senior athletes at that time so um, you know, we had a group of athletes that had you know, poor culture, their relationships, the environment wasn't where it needed to be. Uh, so we spent a fair bit of time just starting to work kids and starting to get them moving. And over a period of six, six eight, nine, ten months, um, the ones that simply didn't want to work just petered away out of the sport. And all of a sudden, we were left with a core group of athletes that brought culture. And um, in that 2006, seven, eight period, uh, there was probably five kids or six kids out of 20 or 30 that made the Olympic team in 2012. So it was a very, um, and it was nothing rocket science, is just bringing a culture and, and work ethic from a young age and um, each year uh, moulding into where it needed to go to. So what they weren't doing the same year after year, there's always a progression and a next step uh, in the way they were uh, heading. 2012. Uh, I was lucky enough to have an athlete on the Olympic team. Um, swimming only won one gold medal and uh, the athlete that I was coaching at the time was a part of the 4x1 team that won the gold medal. Uh, and then from there I come to WA. So I was in Brisbane at that point and then I come to WA. Um, never wanted to leave the program. Um, I, w I was sort of approached by the head coach of the country at that point, uh, Lee Nugent, if I could think about relocating uh, to WA. Um, I think I took it in the end as a challenge. I felt that um, Queensland is a very much a heavyweight with swimming and I felt WA would have the opportunity to be something similar with the climate, um, number of kids and talent I just felt was everywhere in the country. It wasn't just isolated in one little pocket. So I think when I moved from 2012, there was, um, you know, it was a, a large shock. You know, swimming, when I got here, wasn't particularly um, an, a child's number one sport. It was, you know, in Queensland, Swimming is generally a number one sport, and they might do others, whereas when I come here, you're battling other sports. So your environment became pretty important again with what you're working, and then um, the standard of an athlete was far less um, than what I was picking up. So if I was getting, say, a 55 second 100 freestyle girl, and right, I want to try and make this girl a 53, whereas I get a girl over here and she's a 102, and I've got to try and make her a 53. So the standard that they were coming into the sport was um, you know nowhere near what I was what I was getting and you know the best example is probably picking up Zach in 14 or 15 uh, from Broome. Um, I'm not sure how many sessions a week you're averaging one or two or something like that. Yeah. Maybe um, <laughs> Zach was going 103, 300 backstroke at the time, and then within two years he's sort of going 55. So it's not normally as fast as that, um, but I think. Um, you know, things that you, you're aware of, things that you start looking for. So I was looking for um, feel, uh, their relationship with the water, um, how they move. So you just sort of start to develop a different way of thinking when you're working with the athletes. Uh, through that period, um, uh, another young girl that was in 2016, she jo joined the program about 2014. Um, she was training for an event that I thought was okay, but uh, went. I just simply realised that the time wasn't spent on a technical aspect to improve her freestyle. Her freestyle was much better than the event that she was actually swimming. So she was swimming butterfly, she was a national champion, but the faunted freestyle was a much better just looking at the capacity she could swim at. So um, six months of just doing technique work and all of a sudden she's making Australian teams in freestyle. So I think just being aware that um, developing that uh, they might be good at something quite naturally and I question all the time is it talent of the athlete or talent of the coach? If it's a talent of the athlete then sometimes the program only has one athlete in it but they, but they might have 50 kids in there but one athlete's doing the job and I always sit there and go to myself or is that the talent of the coach that's produced the athlete or is it the talent of the athlete that's got themselves through? So I found this athlete that I just felt at the time that probably wasn't explored enough in enough events 
Um, and I always respect coaches that, um, especially in swimming, I look at the people like uh, Dennis Cottrell and Michael Bowl who have put athletes on the Australian team every year for almost 30 years. So they've obviously got a good system in place in which um, they coach to. So, um, you know, I was obviously very lucky with 2016, uh, you know, with Tamsin, she sw swam very well. But then the whole approach post-2016 was not necessarily to be at the world's best in 2017, it's to have the critical mass where it needed to be. So I felt that I didn't want to be going into 2020 with maybe one athlete that can make this Olympic team. Why can't I have 10 athletes that can make it? And then, um, you know, how many of them actually make it? Um, I guess we'll wait and see. But my whole approach in the two years is not to sacrifice results, but to get as many my critical mass where it needs to be so there can be a greater impact for WA. Brilliant. Thank you. Nina. I'm Nina. I pole vault. I won bronze at the Games. Um, my first Australian team was in 2013. Every year since then, I made an Australian team, but only this year did I think I performed. So, um, <clears throat> 14, 15, 16, 17 were all like terrible years internationally, but domestically we're okay. So, yeah, I think it's an age thing. I think I'm finally maturing, and this is the first time where I felt like I performed. So, yeah. <laughs> Very quick, short and short. Um, yeah, I'm Zach. I swim. Um, I started swimming when I was eight. Uh, I was mixed that up in Broome. Um, not many training sessions I did a, a week there. It's probably yeah, about four or five. Um, uh, and yeah, so I did all the typical sports like a little kid would do uh, cricket, footy, and everything like that. Um, up until about 13 when I went away to boarding school at Aquinas College here in Perth. Um, and as I was going through school there, I would only really train um, on the holidays when I would go back to Broome. So there'd be about two weeks every, every you know, four weeks or whatever. Um, and so that went on for about five years. I didn't really get into competition swimming at all, just maintaining like a, yeah, regular teenage boy. Um, and then yeah, 25th, uh, 2014, I think I did a competition down here in Perth, uh, still representing Broome. Um, and after that competition, uh, we did like a camp with Wace, um, and that's when I met Mick. Um, and we did a few like training sessions with him, under him, and uh, you know, after that he pretty much said, um, yeah, come down and train with me for a bit. And, and I was a bit weirded out, uh, but <laughs> no, um, but yeah, my first, and that, um, you know, really training under Mick with, you know, the likes of Eamon Sullivan towards the end of, end of his career and Yolan Kukla, these uh, Olympic gold medalists, so it was a pretty big eye-opener for me and um, it was a lot to learn from those guys and I'm very grateful that, you know, Mick put a lot of faith in me. Um, you know, being this kid from Broome, 102, 100 meter backstroker, so, um, and yeah, that's the way it went, f that's the way it went for a bit, and I uh, made my first team in 2017, World Championships in Budapest, and uh, yeah, Gold Coast in 2018. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Courtney, I'm a netballer, um, I guess I started netball properly when I was eight, but I probably dropped out of the sport till I was about 12, um, like I was just doing every other sport under the sun and I actually hated netball for quite a while. Um, and then I guess from when I started back when I was 12, I probably just went straight through the system. So by the time I was 14, I was in state 17s and Aussie sides, um, played state 19s, Aussie 19s, and I was picked up with the West Coast Fever when I was 16. So I've been in the program for seven years now um, and was in Aussie since I was about 16 too. So uh, lucky enough in 2013 to go away to my first World Youth Cups so under 21s in Glasgow. Um, and then we, I was picked in the World Series Fast Five team. So I uh, walked away with two silvers that year. Um, I think when I was coming through the ranks as a young young player, I was probably raw and quite um, new still to the netball field. So obviously didn't get my opportunities and sat on the bench for four years, basically bench warming at West Coast Fever. Um, and then I guess the last three years to 18 months have been pretty huge for me. Um, 
started getting regular court time at Fever and then um, last 18 months I got picked up by the Australian Diamonds. So I debuted last October um, and then haven't missed a, a game since. Um, and then, yeah, started with the West Coast Fever. We've obviously started winning, so um, pretty positive in that sense. But yeah, so I went through a quad series, a Constellation Cup with, um, with the Diamonds and a quad series and a Com Games. Um, and we were, yeah, Talk lucky to walk away with silver. <laughs> I'm Maddie, I'm from hockey. Um, I'm originally from Victoria, uh, coastal, like South West Victoria, three hours out of um, Melbourne. So. I grew up playing every sport there was and I kind of hated hockey until I was about 16 which some would argue is pretty late because I've kind of already picked that that's my sport. Um, so I was doing competitive surfing um, and tennis, surfing up until I was 16 and then tennis up until about 14 um, and I started making state teams of hockey when I was about 15 which was um, a pretty big commitment for myself and my family being away from Melbourne. We had to travel up to Melbourne. Uh, I think in total like two or three times a week for training and then uh, games. So that was all through affecting school and stuff. So I committed to it pretty early, I guess. Um, and then as soon as I finished school, I finished school early, like 16 and a half or something, moved straight up to Melbourne. Um, a club. I lived with some uh, family that played at the club that I got um, invited to come and train with. Um, and then a year later, I was playing some junior Aussie stuff, not much. I think I went on one tour, um, yeah, and hadn't had much training besides that. I just got a VIS scholarship. Um, so that was kind of my first lot of formal training besides like state team training, which was like pretty sporadic throughout the year, only at um, two month lead up and then you play the tournament. Um, and then, yeah, the year at the VIS and then I got picked up to come over to Perth um, and join the Australian squad but and that was 2016 so that was um rio year i think i played like three games the whole year obviously they were looking to the olympics so I pretty much just sat sat out for most of that year um and i was yeah pretty raw similar like i hadn't had much training before i think going from going down and having a hit like twice a week to and then playing a game on the weekend to training every day was a bit of a shock to me um and i'm someone that really likes a balance of things like I still surf most days um, still play like basketball um, tennis when I can and um, yeah kind of I work and study as well so I do a lot outside of hockey so yeah coming coming into a daily training environment where that's your priority was a bit bit hard for me at the start and it still kind of is um, and then yeah throughout last year I got picked in every tournament um, played through we got a new coach so um, new kind of regime, a lot of girls retired after Rio, so young ones coming through. Um, I think I'm the youngest in the squad, so still very inexperienced. Um, and then the Com Games was my first major tournament, and um, I guess you could look at it two ways, that we were successful, because we came in third ranked and we finished silver and under a new coaching staff and a young team, um, I guess, could look pretty good, but I think um, we still wanted to win gold, so that was, you know, Another thing too. But yeah. And then finally, Flynn, last, last one, please. Hi, I'm Flynn. I'm from hockey as well. Um, so I started playing when I was five, really young. Uh, it's a, I think hockey's a family sport and all my, all my family play and I'm the youngest of six. So yeah, I, I got straight into hockey when I was five. Um, grew up playing a lot of different sports as well, but mainly hockey and cricket. Uh, I finally gave up on cricket when I was 15, 16 and it just focused on hockey. Um, we got in the, uh, the New South Wales Institute of Sport uh, when I was about 16 as well. And I was travelling up from Wollongong tw uh, twice a week to train. Um, made a fair few junior national teams, went to the Youth Olympic Games and the Junior World Cup were probably the main two. Um, and then uh, took me a while to get into the national squad after that. Um, so maybe two years after the Junior World Cup, I got selected, two years, a year after the Junior World Cup, I got selected in the national squad and that was straight after they won the World Cup final 6-1 or something. So it was, a, and that was a world number one team. So it was a pretty good team to get get into. Um, and because of that, I said I didn't get a heap of games in my first two years, I think, leading into the Rio games. 
Um, then they went to Rio, didn't perform as we wanted to. Um, there was a lot of athlete turnover and also coaching staff turnover after that. Uh, I found myself to be in one of the, probably the top half of experience in our squad. So uh, started to get a fair few more games, tore my hamstring off the bone in t at the start of 2017, um, got back to playing January this year and then went to the comp games. So that's terrific. pretty much right. my yeah, story. We stick with you, Flynn, and we go back along the line, even to Mick as well. Can you tell me, tell us about the selection <coughs> process that you went through, the various hoops you had to get through to get yourself uh, to the Gold Coast, please? Um, it was pretty much the same as every tournament for us. So we're always training every day in Perth here. Um, coaches just look at look at the players training and pick a team, usually... Two, week, two weeks out from a tournament, um, but for Com Games it was probably three weeks out, a bit longer for the team. Um, yeah, so pretty much you just train, coaches see what they want to see or don't see what they want to see and you either get selected or not. Two weeks out, they have a meeting with you after the selection and yeah, that's so about it. So in the hockey program, do you, do you think how you train you're being assessed while you're obviously clearly tournaments as well, but you think genuinely why training is a factor in selection? Yeah, training's probably the main thing. Nodding her head as well, yeah. Because um, we only get, uh, I don't know, five or six tournaments a year, so they, yeah. they don't get to see everyone that much in gameplay. Yeah. Um, we actually had a tournament just before our selection. We went to Malaysia and they actually made the selection on the, I got told in the airport, on the way home from Malaysia that I was in the team, so that was a bit different, but yeah, mainly training. Thank you. Maddie? Yeah, we're the same daily training environment, so train well and hopefully you get picked. Yeah, cool. Good. Uh, we cool. get picked off um, our Suncorp performance, so there's 80 players playing Suncorp and they'll pick a squad of 15 from the Suncorp Super League. Um, and yeah, you just find out from Lisa via via call for Com Games. We had just got back from Quad Series in London and South Africa, and the day we got home, we had a phone call. So we probably found out about six weeks leading into the Com Games whether we were in or not. Uh, assuming we have uh, trials for each major event that year. So this year we had it in the Gold Coast, the same as Pan Packs, and it's the top three. Um, the top three finishers in each race will go through and make the team. Oh, and Relays is top six with like four by one and four by two and medley and things. Um, so we have like an A and a B standard um, and a time period to do that within. You most likely get picked on an A, maybe a B. Um, and then we had trials as well where you had to come top two. Um, yeah. And yeah and Mick, how did you get to be a coach? Uh, this year I went through to the um, staging camp to the um, Commonwealth Games and then I uh, come home. Uh, previously, swimming has always been the higher your athlete is ranked in the world. They pick 10 coaches and they just keep working down. Uh, they made a decision uh, after Rio that they were going to go away from that. Um, and some of that would be um, program fit. Uh, but gen generally at the moment there's only... Um, probably 13 coaches in the country, maybe 14, that are putting athletes on the national team. So they pick 10 coaches. So at the moment, there's a bit of a rotation system happening. Um, probably the, always the main thing that with, with the coaching is, is more so whether you're there or whether you're not there, it shouldn't matter how the athletes compete. Um, both times, both Olympics, I've sat in the stands and um, athletes have swum really well. So always the approach, um, if I could give up my spot and have one, two or three athletes of mine added on the team, I'm more than happy to do that. Because I just, the one quote that's always said to me very on uh, was when, uh, when ego is removed, great things can happen. So to me, it's more about the athlete than the coach. So you've got to be there to do what's necessary. But um, yeah, I'm more than happy not to be on the team. And I always make that very clear that if you want me there, I'm there. If not, I'm happy uh, not to be there. And if we can just come back down on the line with the athletes, if you could just explain purely in factual terms about what happened in the Gold Coast. Some of you would have had multiple matches or heats or qualifiers or finals or whatever. So if you just give a, an update, because not everyone will know exactly what happened. So if you 
Um, so the athletics was in the second week. I was on the second last day. Um, there wasn't actually enough girls to do a qualifying, so it was a 14-person final maybe. Um, I think I was out there for three hours and the whole process took about six, so it's a long comp. Um, but yeah. And in your event, you were saying you, you should oh. you came third of a certain height, but yeah. the, two, the two athletes who beat me <laughs> are truly world top of It's a very high quality, yeah. good quality depth, I guess you'd say. That's yeah, and it, you know, it changes from event to event. So, you know, in Glasgow, I think 450 got the gold where I jumped 460 this year and came third, so it really depends on the year. Uh, yeah, my campaign was pretty short and sweet. I only did the 50 backstroke. Um, the heat was the third day. So we, with swimming, it's heat uh, semi-final that night. So it's all one day and then the final is the night after that. Um, and yeah, I was lucky enough to come away with third with uh, two Aussies in front of me um, with Olympic silver medalist Mitch Larkin and uh, defending Commonwealth Games champion Ben Trevor's in front of me. So um, very fortunate to still be on the podium and hear my national anthem being uh, sung, which was pretty cool. Um, and yeah, that's about it really. Um, we go the whole two weeks, so we started the day after the opening ceremony and then finished on the last day. We play six round games, um, so netball split into two pools. We arguably probably had the easier pool to play in, so we went undefeated through the rounds. Um, and then we crossed over for the first time ever with New Zealand um, and absolutely smashed them, uh, which was quite good. And then ended up in a grand final against England um, and they beat us by a goal in the last five seconds of the game. So we walked away with silver um, this time at the Com Games. Yeah, similar, we played the whole time, split into two pools um, and then the top two of each pool play off in a semi crossover and then winners of that play in the final, so yeah. Good, thank you. Uh, yeah, just exact same as the girls, we just started two days after them. With our team, we uh, we don't have too many mentors. You know, a few older guys that were playing or still are playing. We're, we were lucky to have Mark Knowles, one of the greatest, probably one of the greatest players of all time. Captain, that was his last tournament, so he was an inspiration for a lot of us boys, but our leadership group get appointed. Um, uh, appointed by yourself? By, or oh no. Staff? Oh, we appoint our leadership group, yeah. but they get appointed mentors by our um, culture. I don't know, actually know what his role, is, like what his name is, but he's yeah. our culture coach. So they get appointed mentors from outside our sport, which is, they, they're loving that and they, they seem to get a lot out of that. So they could be from a different sport or business or education or somewhere? You yeah, mean, is that what they they're are? from all over the place, I think. Um, oh, very good. Yeah, one of them has a netball or one of them has cricket, I think, as well. Um, yeah, no, I haven't. That's the first I've heard of that. Sounds good, though. Um, yeah, so we're similar. We probably don't have any mentors. Um, the leadership group, we don't have anything like that. It's a team appointed, both um, players and staff, I guess, put together the leadership group. Um, we don't, yeah, I'm, I'm a member of the leadership group. We haven't had any personal development opportunities or anything like that. Um, I think if you want a mentor, you've got to go out and source it yourself. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, yeah, in the Diamonds environment, we our culture is set around the idea of sisters. So everyone that comes into the Diamonds um, is a part of our family. So I think there's 174 Diamonds that have ever played for Australia. So we're quite lucky that that connection is still quite prominent within our within the Diamonds um, sisterhood. So um, in terms of having a mentor, we're very lucky that we can contact any of those Diamonds that have come before us um, and Lisa's very good at setting us up with um, I guess people to talk to when I came into the environment um, I was very raw and very new to diamonds and um, Lisa set me up with two ex defenders that were a part of the diamonds environment just to help me I guess through the process um, and know what to expect but yeah diamonds with the sisters idea is that when you come in you're a big part of the family and um, that everyone in that environment will have your back so we're quite lucky in that sense. Um, I was, like I said, I was pretty lucky when I came into mixed squad. I, there was still um, a lot of decorated 
uh, athletes, uh, especially with, you know, Eamon Sullivan and things like that. So he taught me a lot when I first came and, um, yeah, kind of just told me what to expect with, you know, a lot of things. Um, and then when I made the Australian team, we had, there's like a leadership group that um, the staff and the, the athletes uh, choose. Um, and they're all really approachable people and really good people to have around. And um, yeah, like I said, I'm still learning about everything and everyone's really you know, open and honest about what to expect with things. And um, yeah, it's only my second year being on an Australian team. So plenty more to learn. And Mick's been awesome for me as well. Um, just with, yeah, just his faith that he had in me when I first came. So, yeah, it's all good. Always helps. Um, yeah, I guess if you, in athletics, if you want to mentor, you can almost, like, source it yourself. You know, you still have connections, you know, like me and Steve Hooker, if I ever need something, I'll just text him, call him up. Um, yeah, it's very much like that. In, in your event as well. So, yeah. Nick? Um... I probably have a mentor for each discipline of the stroke, so there's probably, and then I have um, one mentor outside the sport that I work with pretty closely as well. So, and that's more from a probably a personal side of things. Um, but generally, yeah, with swimming, there's so many swimming coaches that um, you know, whether it be middle distance, sprint, um, and there's there's obviously one or two that I talk to probably twice a week. Um, but generally, that. Uh, you know, and that just gets filtered through. That's probably the strength of Queensland, where I've come from, is that we're all very close, and so that's probably um, still goes on from that from that perspective. Ben Haywood, water polo, WA. Uh, probably a question for the team sport guys, hockey and netball. A lot of conversations in high performance world around centralised models and decentralised models. Uh, so probably for the hockey guys, moving from interstate to a centralised program in hockey and then to Courtney around moving from a centralised program at Waste to a club high performance with the fever in recent times, some of the positives and negatives involved in those different models from your from an athlete's perspective? Uh, yeah, I think it's it works really well for us in netball. Um, we are quite lucky with the Diamonds environment. We do get to have a lot of camps together. Um, and when we are picked in the squad, I am only the only WA athlete in the Diamonds. So I get flown over to Melbourne a lot where a lot of the girls are based um, to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions with Lisa. But um, Lisa flies here quite a bit. So Lisa has a lot of contact with our clubs um, on an individual level and obviously has a say in what what she'd like us to, to achieve um, throughout the season. But I think a lot of, um, obviously, our performance is um, based on what Stacey Mirinkovic wants from me, and she drives that a lot. But um, I think it works really well for us. I think when we come into an environment, a camp environment, um, we probably respect that more and get to, because we get to see each other, that we don't get to see each other as much. Um, but yeah, I think it, think it works yeah, quite well. Um, it's a good balance between the Aussie program and then our West Coast Fever program. Yeah, I think for the girls hockey, there's only two girls that are actually from WA and then everyone else has to centralise over here. Um, I think it has positive and negative. I think it's all individualised. There's 27 people and obviously a centralised program isn't gonna suit everyone. Um, so depending on the athlete and um, their level of support networks here or maybe their independence or like they're happy to have a life outside of the one that they left behind. Um, I think that's all, yeah, very individual based. Um, I think it's worked, I guess, for a while now. Well, that's what we've been doing for a while now. Um, yeah, so it's kind of just I'm basing it off history. Like we've been doing the same thing for ages and I don't know, it's not really a discussion yeah, it might happen in the future that we decentralise maybe because of funding or something and it'll be interesting to see how we cope with that. Um, but I think it's important to have in a centralised program still really strong um, national centres like VIS uh, and Swiss, etc., um, that you can go back and train with um, in case of the decentralisation because um, I think that might happen in the future. So, yeah. For those who perhaps aren't so familiar with hockey, that hockey has had this WA focus for more than 30 years now, so it's been going a long time. The, the national program was based here, certainly the mid 80s, wasn't it? 84. Leanne was, Leanne was a poached from New South Wales to come over here. She was one of the first 
hockey roos who moved over. They, in those days, I assume you did there, and I used to stay there when I used to come across from Canberra to talk to the girls, uh, there was a place called Noah Limba, which was a migrant centre uh, over near Bateman or Brink Creek or something like that, uh, which, when I reflect on it, <laughs> it was... Uh, pretty squalid and pretty awful. Um, but then, no matter, that's what it was. Um, and that was where the national programs were run out of what was probably called WACE originally, I think. Maybe it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It was where the national teams were, pretty much. And you had, if you wanted to be in the national team, you had to get on that plane, you had to be over here, up to a point. One or two exceptions were made, which was an interesting, <laughs> interesting thing. We'll get but anyway, sorry, Glenn, interrupted you. Um, yeah, I'll start with the positives, I guess. Um, so I think coming from New South Wales where I trained with N-Swiss with mainly under-21s guys twice a week, you come into Perth and train with some of the best players in the world five, six days a week. So you definitely your hockey definitely improves very quickly. And as a squad, training together every day of the week gives us a huge advantage over uh, all the other countries that play with their club most of the year and then come in for a few camps. So I think that gives us a huge advantage internationally. Um, negatives, you're so far away from home, it costs maybe $500 to get there and back, so that's a that's a pretty big one. Um, but also I think, I have a feeling it sort of weakens our institutes. If you have the national guys training in your institute, then your younger guys get better as well. So I think uh, that's what I feel. I feel like as, an in, as young institute players, they're the best there, so they don't really have anyone better to train against. So I think... If we were to decentralise, it would strengthen the group below us and bring more up with us. Shane uh, from Athletics WA. Uh, the, my question to all of you and the coach as well is on mental toughness. I mean, you've all probably had losses and and uh, disappointments and that through um, uh, and injuries and that. And, and what strategies have you put in place to overcome those uh, um, adversities? You first, please. Your hand. Um, yeah, it's probably a pretty good question for team sports because it can go like one goal against us puts us behind the eight ball straight away. So I think at the moment, as I said, we're working, we have a culture, well, I think he's called a culture coach. I don't actually know what his role is or what his yeah, technical name is. Um, but we work with him a lot. He's actually based in Queensland, but he comes over when we have camps or tournaments and stuff like that. And he just... Uh, his main point is that we need to trust each other and trust what the coaches are doing. So there's a lot of different things around that, but that's that's what he talks a lot about is us trusting each other, trusting the game plan. And once once we're down or something's going against us, don't panic or go into frenzy. We need to just do the same thing we do every every game. Yeah, we have similar things. So we've got a team psych that's currently working on... Um figuring out the individual and the team's stress signatures when we're put under pressure or, yeah, we've gone a goal down, a situation like that, or a big quarterfinal coming up, a must-win game. Um, so we're currently working through that in the infancy stages of that, I would say. Um, and then for, I guess, coming back from loss and stuff, obviously um, in a team everyone's going to deal with it differently and have different strategies. But for me, I think... Um, yeah, it's just about, I'm someone that likes to really switch off from hockey. I'm someone that, like, if I'm not there, I don't want to be thinking about it. Um, otherwise, I won't last very long. Um, so, yeah, I go do other things. Um, when I broke my ankle, I missed out on my Junior World Cup. I broke my ankle surfing a week before we flew out, um, just out here, um, which was pretty annoying. Um, and I was pretty devastated. I just went and um, moved in for two months with... Um, some family friends, one of my mentors, um, I don't know, Mark Hepburn, who played for the Eagles, um, someone who's outside of the sport but still knows a lot about sport. So I don't have to talk about hockey with him, but he fully understands like sport and everything like that. So I did that and then just kind of just had a break, didn't really, um, did some gym, that's about it. Um, and I think I came back f refreshed from that. And I also enjoy after like major tournaments or say for the example of the Commonwealth Games it's a it's a massive lead up it's five months of intensity for a two-week tournament um, and then the, I think the come down after big tournaments can be quite big like you've just built up to all this and now it's over and it's like what, what do I do now just build for the next one so I think that initial stage is kind of hard to get over so um, I think finding other things to almost make you miss that 
intensity is good and helps me, yeah. Mandy, what did the coach say when you broke your ankle? Did they know oh, you were a regular surfer? Yeah, not good. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess at Diamonds and at Fibra, we're lucky that we have um, a team psych. Um, so I guess at Diamonds, we really use the mentality any court, any time for our mental toughness that we can perform anywhere in the world. Um, and with any circumstance. Um, and I guess here at Fever, while we, we work very individually um, on our mental toughness, uh, we finished Com Games and had seven, eight days before round one of Suncorp. So for me, obviously we lost the grand final. I was on the court, I, was the la I got the penalty that missed it to, so England could score the shot. Um, so for me, obviously I had, had to have a bit of mental toughness around that. Um, eight day turnaround for me was really debriefing and going over what what happened. Um, obviously a game of netball's not one in the last five seconds, it's one in 59 minutes and 55 seconds up to that point. Um, but I guess for me in terms of injuries and that, it's really being process driven, knowing that um, it's little, little, little things to get to that next point instead of going so outcome that I need to be back in six months to play in a diamond series. It's really breaking it down and um, I guess for me making sure that um, I have the support around me, making sure that I'm going through the right process to get back to where I need to be. So Courtney, you, you, got in, you had a competition almost straight away after, which I'm sort of thinking is a good thing. Definitely. Got, <laughs> but, but that night, I mean that obviously was as yucky as it ever gets in sport, what, what, did, what did you do? Who spoke to you? What did, you have a buddy to chat to, the coach, how, how did you, you not just you, but as, as the group? It yeah. must have been a bit of a bummer, it was, it was a, a bit of a bummer. <laughs> what, what, how did you address it in the short term? Yeah, we were quite lucky that um, six players had gone to two or more com games before us and um, those com games before us, we'd also won silver. So I guess a lot of the girls know um, how to deal with them, what had been there, um, had been through that. So there was a lot of support in, in that sense. Um, we were quite rushed after the, the grand final, which was probably a good thing. We had to go to the closing ceremony. We had to be at some other events for Gold Dock. So it was probably actually the best thing for us because there was minimal time to dwell on what happened. Um, I think if we had the time, I would have been more of an emotional wreck than I was at that point. Um, but yeah, we, I guess I just turned to some of the, the older girls in the group, in our, in our captains and our leaders to, to help me through it more than anything. Yeah, no. And clearly it, it is different in team sport, we all understand that. But there was a lass, she was either Scottish or Northern Ireland, I can't quite remember, but she was a- Scottish a girl, girl it was missed, horrible. Yeah, missed this shot. Four times. In the basket in the last 10 seconds and missed it and missed it. And they lost that match. And she ran off down the tunnel to the changing rooms. And that was their last match. And I can't remember the consequences. But it meant they didn't finish it. Like they should have done, obviously. Uh, and I just hope somebody rugby tackled her somewhere. <laughs> because it was just, she just went. Yeah. It was like she wanted to bury herself in the sand. Yeah, we felt for did her. They, did they find her? Hopefully they found her. Yeah, her. yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it's obviously a little bit different going through adversity um, in an individual sport uh, than with team sports, but me personally, um, probably this season was uh, probably the toughest. Um, probably doesn't seem like it with Commonwealth Games, but leading into that, um, I had a few injuries that I had to kind of take care of, um, and also coming into trials. So my main event is uh, the 100 metre backstroke. Um, that's probably what I feel most comfortable in. Um, and at the trials, um, I was leading at the 50 and I turned um, and I started hitting the lane rope. So I was in the lead and then I finished at about six, I think. So they wouldn't take me for that. Um, and it just, uh, I remember not really sleeping that well that night um, and I knew that I had the 100 metre freestyle uh, the day, the, the morning after pretty much um, and yeah I, I just wasn't in a great way until probably the morning after um, I kind of just went to Mick and um, you know I kind of just said whatever happens like I just want a lane for the final in the 100 metre freestyle that night um, and you know Mick's really good at calm me down and trying to just put things in perspective for me um, and that's what he did and um, yeah I think 
uh, Mick's main message to me, all the, like whenever we're in competition, is always just to keep it simple and um, don't try and overthink. And you know, whatever happens, happens. And um, he reassured me that you know I've done all the work that I possibly could have this season. Um, and yeah, I think it's you know when you have support like that, you can't really go wrong. And um, yeah, I think. And then you know, so I got through that, and I went gone to the final for the hundred meter freestyle, and then. Uh, again, I didn't really do that well in the final because I probably, you know, all that energy that I spent through that time and, you know, I still, in my mind, I still had the 50 metre backstroke on the last night of competition. So I was lucky enough after the 100 metre freestyle, I had the day to rest and again, Mick was just in my ear the whole time just trying to, you know, make sure I was okay and making sure that I was, you know, still ready to get up and for that 50 metre backstroke. Um, and yeah, I ended up, you know, winning the 100 meter backstroke, uh, 50 meter backstroke at trials. So they took me for that, and um, yeah, rest is uh, yeah history, yeah, I guess. Is it? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so at Waste, we have a sports psych for the individual events. Um, I'd see him one, oh, like once every two weeks. Um, my coach is very. Um, <clears throat> performance based so the mental side for me if I went to him and I was like oh like I'm a bit lost he'd be like we'll just physically do what you have to do so for me I'm very um, I think I'm very emotional and I'm very a mental athlete so like I said before those you know three years internationally where I just like crumbled I have finally built up a resilience and I've almost taught myself um, what I need to do on those big stages and I just turned 21 but like you're always, always, always learning. Um, yeah, I believe that for my event it is like 90% mental. Um, if, I rock up, I, if I rock up and I'm like not there like mentally, I'm like nah, not good but when I rock up with my head like switched on, I um, yeah, it's a very, very different me up there so yeah probably the one thing I know if you're going to be a head coach you've probably got to be prepared to stand alone is probably the thing there and the decisions you make um, you've got to be accountable to the decision I'm not afraid of saying if I've made a, made a bad decision but um, you know because if you're not prepared to stand alone you, you're potentially sometimes too friendly with the athletes or staff too so the, those difficult conversations are harder I feel so I think um, within reason, I'm not saying you need to stand out in the back shed or something like that, but yeah, I think you need to come to terms with that. If you can't come to terms with that, you're probably not uh, going to be able to make those really hard decisions when they count. Um, and then the other one, probably the thing that I always try and think about when going to competitions, which probably helps with the mental toughness, is I try to care less because um, it helps me to make better decisions when I get to the meet um, with whatever it is. Um, I think when Zach... Um, you know, just didn't hit the 100 backstroke, just hit the lane rope and pretty much stopped. It was, you know, just stay in the obvious is that, man, I'm sorry, but you just effed it up. You know, tomorrow's another day. I'm not going to sit there for 45 minutes having a DNM with him. I think it was just stay at the obvious and then get on with it a little bit. So uh, to me, it's um, one of the things I think you said earlier in one of those slides. There are some things on there, I looked at it and I said something about the coach. Um, is you weren't sure what it meant, but regardless, if you can not care, then regardless of the result, you never stop pushing. So um, I think to myself, there's always another meet. Um, so I'm never fearful of, what, of the outcome uh, with the athletes. And you know, there's 15 kids generally got at a national meet. I've never had 15 kids hit, a, hit the meet. So there's always one or two that are off and you got to deal with them individually and that sort of stuff as well. So, um, you know, that's just something that I'll never do is never compromise how hard I'll push as well. So just wait, you'll just never change. Thank you very much. Thanks. Talk to it. Just speak to say your name before. Right. Lily Botros from Badminton WA. Um, this is a question, I suppose, mainly for the athletes. Um, so, and only if the situation applies. So, do you remain in the state team or squad when you are selected in the national program or national team or squad? 
And what's the pro proportion of in terms of time spent at these two different levels of squad or teams? And how do the different uh, training environment, coaching method, or philosophy affect your performance? And how do you adjust to it? I guess um, the question to Coach Nick in that sense is: Do you work with? Are you required, or do you often work with like state level um, coaches or state team coaches? And uh, yeah, well, I'm I'm in a very big system. We have a thousand kids in squads. So uh, in through that, there's probably uh, 20 or 30 coaches. When I first arrived, I worked very heavily, um, but through that, um, I, I kind of feel that um, sometimes your second best coach in the line isn't the one that's working under me. It's the one that's probably working with the juniors because they're developing the culture and the um, technical side of things. So I probably um, really push that some of our best coaches are working with our 10, 11, 12 year olds, not our necessarily our 13, 14, 15, 16s, because that foundation is the most important. So, yeah. Um, so once a, once a fortnight we have a coaches meeting is about it from that, and then I guess um, we're swimming. Sam there, if Sam asked me to do something, then sometimes I, I um, push myself there, Sam, don't I? But yeah, but generally, yeah. It depends on the, the culture and that sort of stuff too, so that's where I look at. And Blackhand, you have a personal coach on the team? Yeah, but like I don't... But quite often you get selected onto the national team, you don't have your personal coach there. And the other person who's got an overall responsibility, and is generally a good operator, they're not there by fluke. You know, they then are not sure, you know, they're seeing something they really don't like, but should they interfere and mm. give some technical thing or should they well, really I mean, not? It's a real... Have, have the, um, yeah. players yeah. There, there have been some coaches I've seen in, in, in the Australian mm -hmm. Athletics team, the appointed coaches who have been brilliant at that and there have been some others who have just crushed the living daylights out of the young athlete um, mm -hmm. and that's a reflection more on the organisation and how it didn't manage or monitor that situation but unfortunately it's a bit like that transition from the daily performance environment to the holding camp. That transition I've come from having one-to-one -one coaching I've now got this person who must be a good coach, they must be credentialed, but their strategy is 180 degrees different from my coach back home, blooming hard. You know, and, mm. and you've seen medals and performances thrown away and we're at the holding camp. We haven't even got to the place where the foreigners are yet and the medals have been thrown away or the performance have been thrown away. A few days or anything? Um, I'll, on, as Mick was saying about uh, coaching selection criteria with the Australian team, um, he wasn't on there this year, so I got uh, elected another coach. So yeah, it's I guess it's all just about adjusting to that style as well. Um, and they typically try and put like backstrokers together with like a coach that knows a bit of backstroke, I guess, and stuff like that. So <laughs> <laughs> you'd hope so. Um, but yeah, with the state. I think there was something about a state team during the season or something. Um, swimming, we don't really ha like have like a state team that they select off. So I'll probably represent um, the like a local club, like UWA West Coast yeah. is my club that I represent at trials and things. So domestic kind of stuff, and then yeah, Australia and international. So presumably, Mick, that that coach who then sort of was in charge. Yeah be very light touch, would they? They wouldn't be making major... No, so Mick well, would probably, yeah. <laughs> Mick would well, Zach thinks not. That's all that matters. Mick, Mick usually like feeds me yeah. um, what to do and then I give it to he's going to be in the, potentially in the same country, yeah. even if he's just at the home. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Mick, any observations that you're prepared to make? I think on that one, like I, you know, the culture of your program to me is whether I'm there or not there is how they compete. You know, they should, if I'm not at training, are they still going to work at the same level if I'm, if I'm there? You know, those, if that's happening at training, it's more than likely going to happen when they race. And then, you know, I always say to the athlete, I'm available at any, any point that you need me. Um, it's not really an issue, but rarely do I get, um, you know, if every few days I might get a phone call or can I catch you at seven o'clock at night or whatever it is, just for a few moments. And, and most of the time it's, they're talking to me, just going over, 
the basics of what they're, they're doing, I'm not really saying very much. So, um, because you're doing that all in the preparation. So, Courtney, Maddie, and Flynn, is it relevant you had to say something? Yeah, I guess um, obviously we, we train under Stacey here in Perth, and then we go into the Diamonds environment and we have Lisa. Um, and it's probably taken me, to be honest, a good 18 months to get to know Lisa. She's a very quirky person, if anyone's had anything to do with her. Um, she is very different um, um, in the nicest way. She's true to who she is. Um, and I guess going into that environment too, we have um, our defence coach is actually the head coach of the Queensland Firebirds. So I guess also throwing that in the mix, it's, it, it, you do get to a point where you're like, how much can I open up and how much can I tell them? Because come eight days later, we are playing them in a Suncorp Super League. So she knows all my weaknesses and my strengths um, but I guess in terms of um, Lisa and Stacey's relationship um, they work very well together Stace knows what I want to work on she feeds that to Lisa where Lisa feeds back to Stace week, um, weekly so they speak most Fridays um, just to check in how I'm doing so that transition from West Coast Fever into Diamonds is quite quite seamless um, they've done a fantastic job of making life very easy for us to go between the two programs seen as we are 12 month athletes now um, we have a AHL, uh, an Australian Hockey League tournament once a year, um, so we all split up and go back to our um, states and play in that domestic league. Um, so I think from being a Victorian, um, the VIS and the girls that are a part of that now um, have been and then have come over to the program, we still have really strong links back to our NTC, so um, I think it's not always the case in all of the states, but I think um, the VAS has done a really good job of creating a really, really good culture that we all still want to be a part of and stay a part of. And um, like our coach still pays for us Perth girls that are here to catch up and have dinner as a group, just Victorians, even though we see each other every day once a month. So um, I think it's a pretty good reflection of um, that, the strength of our state, of our personal state. Um, and then with the coaching, I think in hockey, it's a bit different because as a junior, it's not like you have an individual coach. Um, it's like every team you go through and play for, usually you have a different coach and it's more about the team and how the team, like our way of play rather than individual. But I think um, as an individual, I think it's important. I, I've found it's important for me to recognize that every coach is different um, and they're good at different things. So if you want something that one coach can't offer, another coach is going to be more than happy to give it to you if you ask for them to do so. So I think that's what I've found in the last couple of years. Um, my first year when I wasn't playing at all, um, I didn't have the best relationship with our coach at the time. And I sought um, an external, one of the assistant coaches of the boys program at the time. And I was doing individual sessions twice a week outside of our daily training environment with him. Um, so, and then, yeah, I think it's just about if you need something, you have to go get it yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Last one, Flynn. Uh, yeah, I'll just add a little bit on the AHL. I think for us, it's weird going back to our states a bit because we only go back, say, two weeks before the tournament. So we get two weeks of training with them where they've been training for six to eight weeks probably. Um, so I think it's on us to fit in with the, with the team and the coach. We can't really just go back in and expect things to re revolve around us. So, yeah, I think it's more on the players in that situation to fit in with what they've already done because they will already have a game plan and tactics lined up. We just have to, yeah, fit in where we can. So that's all I'll add to Maddie. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have to call back to a hall. These young people have to go off and do other things. They don't like sitting around on their bottoms for too long. And I'm sure Mick's the same as well. Uh, I'm a sad, sporting, tragic who think of nothing better to do than to sit in the presence of medal winning athletes um, so I can say it forever but we've got to move on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen please join me in thanking our athletes and our coach for their contributions. Mm -hmm.